Okay, very good. I, um, I've been working on spoonbills since 1989, uh, focusing my work in South Florida, uh, in uh, Florida Bay actually, which is the bay that, that uh, the Keys extend off the southern end of the state, and in between the mainland and the Keys is Florida Bay. And historically that was the only place in the United States that spoonbills nested. And over the last 30 years, because of problems with the Everglades, the Everglades is connected to Florida Bay, with problems in the Everglades, the population has decreased uh, by about 90%. Um, and so that is the gist of my research, is trying to figure out why the spoonbills have been declining. And it's not just about spoonbills. Uh, spoonbills are an indicator species. Uh, for Florida Bay and for the Everglades and, and it's uh, you know people think that well, I just study this beautiful pink bird well it's very sensitive to its environment and so um, you know we we really need to know what it's doing so that we can understand the ecosystem itself and of course in the Florida Keys we rely most heavily for our money on things like fishing and tourism and if these birds are not doing well there, then neither are the fish. Uh, and without the fish, we don't get many tourists. So it really affects our economy. And what we're trying to do by studying spoonbills is change the way that the Everglades are currently managed uh, with the hope that we can restore the health of not only Florida Bay, but the entire Everglades, which is basically all of peninsular Florida. Um, and that's the gist of the research, is to help redesign or replumb the Everglades for the benefit of everybody in South Florida. Uh, that's where we get our drinking water. Again, that's what provides the environment that people like to come to Florida and, and visit Florida for. Um, so I guess that's uh, the, the, the quickest way I can get uh, to summarize what we're doing. Now, spoonbills themselves are... Um, again, beautiful, and they're wonderful animals to study, uh, but seeing them in the wild is really something, and that's what I've been working with uh, St. Augustine Alligator Farm, where the pictures you're seeing are being taken. Uh, we have been banding birds there, uh, and we have been, we're using the camera, hopefully, to get some data about how frequently they feed their young, what they do overnight. These are questions that we just don't have the answers to. And so Explorer is providing us an opportunity to uh, see some of the behaviors. So again, that we can understand this animal that tells us so much about our environment. Um, now, Spoonbill started nesting at the St. Augustine Alligator Farm, I believe in 2010. Um, and that's as far north at that time as they nested uh, in the state. And historically, the the furthest north they ever nested was the Tampa Bay area. And so St. Augustine being almost to the Georgia-Florida border is a record of how far north they went. Well, now they're nesting in Georgia and in South Carolina. And we think this, I think this is the one of the most important things is that that's a result of climate change. And so now it's opened up a whole nother level of research, research for me uh, and for my colleagues to look at this bird as an indicator of sea level rise and climate change. Um, so if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Sure, I was wondering uh, if you would expand a little bit about spoonbill as an indicator species. Uh, what are some ways that it relates to the ecosystem around it? Well, spoonbills have a, a, are what we call tactile feeders. So when you see other fish-eating birds, they're using sight to identify their prey and then striking at it, whether it be a bald eagle or a great blue heron or any other fish-eating birds, pe pelicans and, and kingfishers, what they do is they look for fish and then dive on them or strike at them. Spoonbills feed, they don't, it's not that they don't use their sight, but their bill is really, really sensitive. And so when they walk through the water, it's really touch that allows them to get their prey. And 
spoonbills primarily eat these little fish that are about, oh, I don't know, well, they're less than two inches. Anything bigger than two inches is too big for them to eat. Um, and so they got to walk through the water, swing their bill back and forth, and when they encounter one of these fish, their bill snaps shut and they swallow it. And they can do this very effectively. But for that to happen, you also have to have all the little fish. And all the little fish have to be really concentrated. Um, and that's where spoonbills are so sensitive, is, is if they don't get these high concentrations of little fish, um, then they can't get enough food to feed their young. And then that's what causes the population decline. In a healthy environment, these fish get concentrated by uh, pools drying out or tide pools, the, you know, the tide goes out and the pools decline. Um, there's a lot of that in Florida and wherever you find spoonbills. But if that's not there, then they're the first bird species to go um, it, because they are so sensitive because of the way they feed. And so it tells us a great deal about the environment. And the reason that these little fish are so important is because everything feeds on them. So things like the game fish all go for these little fish as well. Well, it's really hard to follow the game fish around uh, since they're underwater, uh, but with spoonbills, they're conspicuous. So I can see where they're going, I can count their young, I can uh, really uh, quantify what they're doing and then be able to talk about the environment from that aspect. So that's what makes them a good indicator species. Great explanation. Thanks so much. Uh, we have a number of viewer questions coming in, so uh, let's start with some of those. Uh, does, does the spoon bill make uh, the bird's head top heavy and hard to hold up? No. Um, the, the bills are remarkably light. Um, I, I, I do have several spoonbill skulls, and they're also, um, they're, they're, if you look at the skull itself, it's very porous. Um, and the bill is, that's where the nerve endings come through. I was telling you how sensitive their bill is. Well, their bill has all these little tiny holes where the nerve endings come through. And because of that, it's very, it's very, very light. Um, you'd be amazed that, that this big bird has such a, uh, a light skull. And so, no, it, it's a perfectly designed fishing machine. It really is. Um, so, no, it, it, it doesn't cause them any problems at all. They actually seem to enjoy it. Um, on the cam, uh, we see that they're living above the alligator. Do the alligators do the spoonbill as prey? Yes. Um, but the spoonbills are very savvy about that. There's a relationship between alligators and all of the wading birds that you see on the cam is that the birds themselves are attracted to the alligators, even though if the alligator catches them, they're gonna eat them. So it's kind of a love-hate relationship. And the reason that they are attracted to alligators is because the alligators swim around underneath their nest and then things like ra or raccoons and bobcats and possums can't get to their nest because the alligators will eat them just as soon as anything else. And the alligators also get a benefit because being sloppy, uh, spoonbills and the other wading birds are very sloppy eaters, is that they'll drop a lot of food in the water and then the gators will eat that food. And so there's this synergistic relationship. The, the alligators provide protection. Uh, the, the birds, including spoonbills, give them some food and the alligators like to eat the birds when they get the opportunity. So it's a very curious relationship, but it, it is definitely one that, that benefits both species. Great, that answers actually the next two questions, uh, how the alligators somehow protect the spoon bills. And uh, well, what are their predators? You mentioned raccoons. Are there um, flying animal birds that are also predators uh, the nest that the alligators can't protect them from? Yeah, uh, the, the, the eggs themselves are subject, the eggs and, and the very young chicks are very subject to crows. Uh, any species of crow can come in and they are so smart and so patient is that once a crow enters a colony, it can just wait the parents out. Um, they'll defend against crows and in a healthy colony, the crows won't get anything. But if one of the parents doesn't come back, for example, it, it, something happens to it, then it becomes, you know, the crows just, just go right to the nest and they'll eat the, the young and the eggs. And there are a number of egg predators like that. Another bird that we know eats spoonbills are bald eagles. 
The bald eagles will catch. Uh, they particularly go after the younger birds, uh, the birds that are naive, that are only like just beginning to learn how to fly. I have actually chased a bald eagle off of a spoonbill nest. I was, I was uh, approaching the spoonbill nest to check on my chicks, and the bald eagle was actively eating my chicks. Um, that was a shocker. Um, and then, of course, snakes. And especially since we've got pythons now in the Everglades, that's a real danger, too. So all of these things can, can really affect a, a spoonbill colony or a wading bird colony. Do the spoonbills have any sort of natural protection? themselves uh, to defend them Curiously, yeah, they, not really. Um, they, as you can see, their bill is very pliable and soft. And so they aren't, you know, it's not like a heron where it can strike with a very sharp bill and chase the predators off. So it's like, okay, how does this bird defend itself? What they are, are very strong. Um, if you watch like this mixed wading bird colony you're looking at, if you watch the spoonbills fly alongside some of the heron species, they fly much, much faster. It's a much faster, much stronger flying bird. And so their, their defense is really in their strength. Um, you know, they can't really fight with their bill, but they can beat you up pretty good with their wings. Um, and that's how they interact with each other, too. That's how, um, uh, you know, they, they, they actually will, when they get together to mate, they'll spare off, pair off and they'll slam into each other. It's kind of an interesting thing to see. Should we catch that on our camp? Uh, yeah, that's going to be, I, I, it wouldn't surprise me if you do see that, if we leave the cameras up sometime. Um, you know, it's not, it's not likely to just appear on the camera, but it, it's a really tremendous thing to see. Uh, is the pink, uh, the pink pigmentation related to the spoonbill diet like it is with flamingos? Um, yes and no. Is that all of their colors in, in, in the wild obviously have to come from what they feed on. The difference between flamingos and spoonbills is not the color. They actually have the same pigments. But spoonbills primarily eat fish, whereas uh, flamingos primarily eat crustaceans, little shrimp. Um, and since the shrimp have a lot of the same, that same color in them, the flamingos just, they don't manufacture it themselves. They just put it into their feathers and they become pink. So if you don't feed a flamingo the right diet, it turns gray. Spoonbills don't do that. No matter what you feed a spoonbill, it's going to remain pink. Uh, so it, it actually manufactures that color through its, its metabolism. And no matter what it's feeding on, it's going to be pink. So even though the colors are the same pigments, uh, it's a very different energetic for them to have their color. Interesting. Um, okay, Jerry, I'm reading that uh, some viewers are having uh, trouble hearing my questions, if you wouldn't mind repeating. Oh, sure. Okay. Um, are spoonbills monogamous uh, in that they have a lifelong mate? Uh, the question is, are spoonbills monogamous and do they have a lifelong mate? And the answer to that is, uh, again, yes and no. Um, what we've seen with our banding program is that the same pairs tend to pair up. Uh, but we don't know if they do that consistently over their lifetime. So there's this concept that maybe they're serial, serially monogamous, meaning that they'll stay with a mate for several years and then maybe switch to another. Um, so we don't really know that they mate for life or not, but what we do know is that they are pr promiscuous, is that you will have, there was a study done in Brazil where they did genetic work on chicks from the same nest, and they found that um, a good number of them, more than 50%, were either unrelated or half-siblings, which means they would have the same mother or father, but not both. And so we know that there is some nest, what we call uh, nest parasitism that within a colony. So uh, if I'm a, sp a female spoonbill and I see an unguarded nest that has eggs in it, I might go deposit my own egg in that nest and then those parents will raise it. That benefits me. Uh, on the other hand, if I'm a, a male spoonbill and I see a female and her mate is not around, well then it might benefit me to mate with her, she'll lay an egg that's unrelated to the father, and then the father raises the young. 
and that's very common within a lot of the wading bird species. Um, they do not, well, to some degree, again, oh, I'm sorry, the question is, do spoonbills migrate? And the answer to that is, again, yes and no. They migrate on a small, on a small level. So, for example, the birds that I study in Florida Bay, when they are not nesting in Florida Bay, they disperse throughout the entire Everglades, which is, again, almost all the peninsula of Florida. So when we put satellite trackers on those birds, we could see that they would move up the coasts uh, as far north as Tampa Bay, which is, you know, I believe about 300 miles. And then they would turn around and come back and nest in Florida Bay again. Also, the young disperse much farther than the adults. So a bird that was born in Florida, hatched in Florida Bay uh, this year might go as far north as St. Augustine and then turn around and come back. Or it might stay in St. Augustine for the rest of its life and, and migrate there. We had one satellite tag bird that uh, was, uh, one morning was just south of Miami in Florida. And whatever made it take off, it flew all the way across the Straits of Florida to the Bahamas. And so that some of the birds migrate, but the majority of them are homebodies. They're just going to, wherever they were hatched, that's where they're going to go to nest. And that's what we're seeing at St. Augustine as well. We got birds there that are now third generation. So I banded a bird in Tampa. That bird moved to St. Augustine, nested there. We banded uh, one of that bird's chicks, and now that bird is nesting there. And this year we put bands on its children. So they do tend to come back to the exact same place to nest, um, but there, there is a small group that goes elsewhere. No, um, they, they are, uh, as far as the um, taxonomy goes, which is how we classify birds, is that they are within the same group. But new genetic studies, and I just found out about this, are showing that, that they really are not very closely related. Um, that they, the two species have uh, done what we call convergent evolution. They are not closely related, but they come together because they're exploiting the same resource. And so they have similar feeding and nesting habitats, whilst flamingos are entirely different nesters than spoonbills. But they have, you know, a similar habitat. You'll see flamingos and spoonbills feeding together, uh, but they are not that closely related. Do they eat anything uh, beyond... Uh, question is, do they eat anything beyond sea creatures? Well, yes, uh, they um, they eat. They tend to feed in areas where freshwater and saltwater mix, but they also nest in places that are entirely freshwater, and so they will eat aquatic, freshwater aquatic organisms as well. They mostly nest on the coast and they mostly feed in the marine environment, but. They will go to freshwater wetlands and feed on freshwater animals. Uh, do they feed on land? No. Uh, they are designed to put their bill in water and feed that way. Um, there's one record of, of spoonbills, um, and this is back in the early 60s, I believe, where they were having uh, really tough conditions in the Everglades, and somebody observed them trying to feed on an upland where it's grass and they could not, they just didn't survive. Um, so they have to have a water environment. Uh, watching the spoonbill baby, they're very active. Do they fall off the nest? Is it uh, Question is, 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 is it dangerous for uh, the spoonbill chicks, since they're so active, to fall out of the nest? And without some kind of intervention, they're very good at staying in that nest. Um, uh, I have personally had to, to collect chicks that fall out of a nest and put them back in, but that's because they see me and get scared. And that happens very infrequently, but it has happened, uh, where I have to actually pick up a bird, climb back up in a tree, and put it back in the nest. Uh, of course, if I didn't do that, it's unlikely that, that the bird would 
survive. They got to be up high. And like I said, there are always like uh, alligators, crocodiles, or something under the nest that, that is going to try to kill them. Um, but no, the mortality that we see is generally from starvation, is where the parents just can't find enough food. Uh, and that is the real, real critical problem for the spoonbill chicks. Uh, they're healthy, like you see in these pictures. Those birds are unlikely to fall. Okay, the question is because the chicks are of varying sizes, do, uh, do the parents raise all of them and how successful are all the chicks? The spoonbills generally lay three eggs and they are staggered by a couple of days. So they lay the first egg and then they wait two days and they lay the second egg and they wait two more days and then they lay the third one. Um, and so the first one to hatch is always the biggest one. It gets fed two days in advance and they really, really grow fast. I'm sure if you've been watching these cameras, you see that, is that, you know, the spoonbill will go from the size of their egg, which is the size of a chicken egg, to the size of the adult in six weeks. And with three chicks, of course, that means that the parents got to bring back a lot of food. Um, and so probably it, it is lucky for, it's very rare that all three of those chicks will survive. Generally speaking, two, if two survive, the parents have done a remarkably good job. Um, in our current environment, it's usually about one. Um, and we get lucky, St. Augustine is so well positioned that, that we do get, generally speaking, two successful chicks per nest. Um, so one of the chicks is likely to die. And the reason that they look so different is because the youngest one's not getting fed as much. But the youngest one is also kind of an insurance policy. So if you were watching the other day when it was raining so hard, um, if it kept raining like that, the larger chicks would actually be in more danger because they would get cold quicker and then the the older one might die. And that's the insurance policy is then the younger one, which the parents will take over and raise. And so it's, I mean, they, basically they lay three eggs as an insurance policy. How do you think the birds will be affected if the EPA is dismantled? Question is, how will these birds be affected if the EPA is dismantled? Uh, very much so. Um, the history of, of the EPA starts with the, the book Silent Spring by Rachel Carson. And the gist of that book is that because there were no environmental protections in the 60s and 70s, that the use of pesticides was devastating our animals, particularly insects and birds, is what she documented. My organization, Auto, National Audubon Society, did numerous studies and found that what was happening is that the eggshells themselves, because of the, the DDT uh, poison or the or, uh, organic poisons, the shell just was so weak that it would break and the chicks would die right then and there. Um, so that is where the EPA started, was with that silent spring, with why are all our birds dying off again? Um, and without an EPA, uh, yeah, we're right back to using whatever we want. Uh, using illegal insecticides and poisons, um, the EPA is critical to our, our wildlife, and, and I don't understand it. I clearly don't. Yes, there may be some regulatory things that, that need to be cleaned up at the EPA, but you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. There's a lot of very good things that the EPA has done, and if it goes away, our environment is much, much better than when I grew up in the 70s, and we're going to go right back to having 100% smog every day, everywhere we live. And the EPA has been so beneficial to our lives, and it scares me. Is it the tea disaster in the Gulf of Mexico affecting the decline in Florida Bay? Uh, no, it did not, fortunately. Um, the, oh, I'm sorry. The question is, did the BP event in the Gulf of Mexico affect the, Florida, the, the birds in Florida Bay? Um, fortunately, no. We were lucky in that there is a, uh, the, what's called the loop current 
which turns into the golf current or, or the um, golf stream, uh, went up very close to where uh, Deepwater Horizon was, but didn't go through it. If it had, it would have circled back around along the Florida coast and ended up in Florida Bay. Um, and that would have been devastating. But fortunately, that did not occur. We got lucky. That's pure and simple. If, if it had been a little bit warmer that year or a little bit colder, the Gulf Stream could have changed directions, could have gone right through where Deep Hot Water Horizon was and boiled every beach from Tampa around to uh, Miami. The entire coast could have been just, just annihilated the same way the uh, Panhandle Coast was. Why the question is why do spoonbills stand on one leg in the nest? And um, I don't know. I ask them a lot of questions, and they don't ever answer me. Um, but that is um, it is it's typical of wading birds is that they they will rest on one leg um, and then tuck their head back around under their wing, and that's how they rest. Uh, and I imagine it's just as simple as you know why do human beings cross their legs when they sit down, or why do you lean? Uh, you know, against the wall if you got the opportunity. Um, you know, that it's just comfortable. Um, that's the only way I can answer that. Are they aggressive to humans? No. No, they are not at all. Um, as a matter of fact, there have been uh, uh, known where it doesn't happen anymore because it's illegal, but um, there have been people who have kept spoonbills as pets. Uh, you know, back in the 40s and 50s, a, a nest would get abandoned or something, and people would go rescue the chicks and raise them, and the birds would just follow the people around. They become imprinted on them, and no, I mean they, for the most part, they're terrified of human beings, uh, but they get acclimated, as you can see. The, there are people right there, right with those birds at St. Augustine Alligator Farm, walk, walking right past them, and say they can get used to people, but in no way would they ever. Uh, want to mess with a giant primate like a human being. Are the spoonbills nest dwellers as well as shorebirds? I'm sorry, would you say that again? Are the spoonbills nest dwellers as well as shorebirds? I don't know. Nope. I understand the question. Well, are they, um, it, are they nest dwellers and shorebirds? Are, are, the question is, are, are spoonbills nest dwellers like shorebirds, I guess? Um, I'm going to take a shot at that in that um, spoonbills only attend a nest for a very short part of their, their year. Um, for, it, it, for example, the birds that nest in Florida Bay are generally begin nesting in November or December and finish by February or March. The rest of the year, they are not anywhere near where they nest. They are moving around the Everglades finding food. As far as shorebirds go, most of the shorebirds uh, nest on beaches. They're beach nesters. And so they, they literally carve out a little divot in the sand, and that's their nest habitat. Um, and so it's a, it's a very different nesting strategy. Do the birds or, and or their chicks branch or fledge? I'm sorry, could you say that again? Do, do the spoonbills... Um, Branch or fledge? Do they go out on branches? Yeah, yeah. They, and when that's what actually the question is: Do they do they go out on branches and then fledge? And and um, the answer to that is absolutely. Is that is what we call them uh, for the first three weeks of their life? They are pretty much confined to the nest. They just don't have the strength to get up and move out of the nest and grasp a, a branch. Um, and so they stay in that nest, even though they can get up and walk around in the nest, they don't go out on the branches. At about three weeks of age, their, their, their legs and their balance are strong enough that they actually do go out on those branches. And so they'll hang around on those branches um, for about another three weeks. And, and they'll still stay right around the nest and sometimes get in the nest, but they're mostly crawling around through the branches. And we refer to those as branchlings. And then after about another three weeks, they start to fly. And the way this is, this is something that's unique to spoonbills, they do what, what we call a weaning flight. 
is that the parents will bring back food and make their chicks chase them as far as they can so that they learn how to fly. So the parent will come back, kind of tease the chick, say, look, I got, I got dinner, and then it'll fly off. And if the chick doesn't follow it, then the parent doesn't, you know, it'll fly off maybe 20 feet and wait there and say, come on, you can come over here and get the food. And then after about a week, they might fly, you know, 500 feet and say, okay, if you want dinner, you're going to have to fly over here. And eventually they just keep getting, the, the weaning flights just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually they just leave. So the, the adult will, will fly back to where they're getting food and the chick will follow them. And we assume what happens there is that the chick learns how to feed itself by watching the parent. Oh, I'm not really good with, <laughs> with numbers. They, um, how tall are they is, is probably about, with, you know, when they're standing erect, they're probably about um, maybe, maybe close to three feet. I know that their wingspan is closer to six feet. Um, and that, that's what I say, and they're such powerful flyers. Their wings are much, if they stretch out their wings, they're much wider than they are tall. Um, and then as far as weight goes, they're very light. Uh, I believe they weigh about eight pounds, maybe nine pounds, something like that. Um, I, I, I'm not very good at memorizing numbers. I was never very good in like history class cause I couldn't remember dates, but it's somewhere around that. Um, you know, it's a, they're very light. All birds that, that fly have to be light. It's just a matter of them being able to fly. Um, how can they be so big and so light? Uh, the skeleton of birds is, is basically hollow. Uh, if you look at our bones, you know, it's full of marrow and they weigh a lot. Um, you know, the bone is very dense. With birds, that bone, bone is very porous. So it weighs a lot less. There's just not as much calcium and hardness in a, in a bird bone. They're very brittle, um, but that's what makes them light. And, and they are mostly just, you know, most of their weight, rather than coming from bones, as in mammals, it comes from um, muscle. And that's how, you know, they just got lots of muscle to be able to fly. Um, John, just to give you, or, or uh, Rick, just to give you a warning, is that um, I am on battery power here, and I'm running low. So I just wanted to give you a heads up that we might, we might get cut off here. I got 8% battery left. Okay, uh, well, we just have a couple more questions anyway, so let's uh, see if we get to them, and we'll, we'll wrap up. Okay. Uh, is there much sibling rivalry between the two? No, um, I just, I, I, you don't see them being aggressive with, you, with each other. Uh, I've never observed that, and I, I, watching this camera, I've never observed it. Um, but I did just read a, a summary of an article about another species of wading bird, a, a, a white stork in Europe. And the question is, is that they have five chicks in a nest. And the question is, well, how do, what happens to the other chicks? Because they only fledge one or two. And it turns out that the siblings are really kind of very polite to each other. And I think that's true of most wading birds, is that the siblings themselves, you know, I, I, they, get, they get benefit from their siblings uh, surviving as well. Um, and so, no, there isn't that kind of of aggressive behavior within a nest. And how big is your research team? Uh, currently, um, I have, um, counting myself, nine full-time employees, and then I have uh, two part-time employees and one seasonal employee. Um, I've had as many as, um, I believe at one point I had 18 people working for me. And then when times get lean and I, I can't get funding, I've had as few as, as just three other people. Uh, and so it fluctuates. But right now, I'm on pretty solid footing uh, with Everglades restoration work that I'm, I'm working on. And I have, you know, I'll have somewhere between seven and nine pretty much consistently. Thanks. Okay, I guess we can wrap up. I want to thank you so much for your time and answering all of our spoonbill questions. Uh, we didn't know a lot about them before the cam went up, so it's exciting. And it's great to see them during the, their nesting season. Um, 
Do you have any uh, closing remarks you'd like to make? No, just enjoy the, the, the camera. I'm learning so many things from that ca those ca that camera as well. Um, and I, you know, I'll leave it on in the background uh, all the time. And some things that I've seen documented in, uh, you know, articles or picture drawings, I've actually seen those things now for the first time. Um, and so just enjoy it. it is, it's, it's a wonderful thing. And I, I appreciate everybody's time. And thanks for calling in. Great, thanks so much. All right, everybody have a good day. Okay. Goodbye. Bye.